Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Fiek Machnil. I'm director of the Abbey Theatre. And uh, we're on to the next uh, section. Last year, one of the... Um, one of the things we did was uh, a kind of interventions through the three days around uh, particular uh, situations or particular uh, issues that we just felt we could share with you as, uh, as our delegates and audiences and artists. So last year, if, if some of you are here will remember, we had Carl O'Brien uh, did a presentation on uh, direct provision. Um, and then also we had uh, Tom Clonan who, who uh, did a presentation around, around his book and, and his experience of being in the Irish Army um, in, in Lebanon. So we've a, we've a couple of those interventions again uh, 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 this year, and we start with uh, Ray Dolphin. Now, Ray Dolphin is an Irishman and has been working in the West Bank in the Gaza Strip and for a period in the Balkans for the last 25 years. He is currently based in East Jerusalem, and he's here in his official capacity, uh, working with the United Nations Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs. He wrote, the, he wrote a book called The West Bank Wall, Unmaking Palestine in 2006, and also provided a text for, the, for an extraordinarily exquisite and, and beautiful uh, book, photo book called Wall by the veteran um, Czech photographer Joseph Kudelka. So I'll introduce you uh, to Ray Dolphin. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, first of all, thanks, Fiek, for inviting me to the Symposium Theatre of War. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a PowerPoint presentation on the West Bank. The uh, UN agency I work for is the humanitarian arm of the UN, so we, we work in emergency situations, both situations of war and natural disaster. The situation in Palestine is a little bit different from our normal situation, not necessarily because the, it's the worst conflict. Um, we've seen, for example, in the last um, presentation on Rwanda, but what it is different is it's a very long, protracted co conflict. It's been go going on for at least 50 years, and we actually call it a complex or a protracted emergency. So what I want to do is I want to try and unpick some of that complexity and look at some of the underlying causes of the uh, situation in the West Bank. Um, and we've called the presentation the fragmentation of the West Bank. And the fragmentation is it's a result of both physical policies by the Israeli government and also bureaucratic policies. Now, the physical ones, as you'll see, you'll be familiar with some settlements. Everyone's heard of settlements, the wall or the barrier, and the various obstacles. Perhaps the bureaucratic ones are not so familiar, but we look at those. I just want to say something about the other part of Palestine. We don't have time to talk about it this morning, unfortunately, but that's Gaza. And the photograph there is from the, this summer. We had the third war in six years in the Gaza Strip in July and August, in which over 2,500 uh, Palestinians were killed, mainly civilians. And the, the main problem we have at the moment is displacement. There are over 100,000 Palestinians in, Gazas, in Gaza who have no homes due to the massive destruction, primarily by the Israeli Air Force. And the Gaza Strip is part of Palestine, and it is part of the fragmentation as well. It's divided by Israel, <clears throat> and Israel imposes a blockade on the Gaza Strip, so any, the movement of both peoples and goods in and out is, is very heavily restricted. What's perhaps new is, in the last year and a half, we've also had a blockade by the Egyptian government, um, and the the crossings which are controlled by Egypt are also closed, so the blockade in Gaza has intensified over the last year and a half, and it is a major problem, particularly in terms of reconstruction for all the, the homes which were um, damaged after the war. So if we go to the West Bank, um, I don't think this is going to work, this is Google map. I'll just go quickly to... We have a little... Oh, um, good. This is the, the West Bank. Um, you're probably familiar, even people who haven't visited the West Bank are probably familiar with some of the names um, from biblical and literary associations. So we have East Jerusalem, Bethlehem to the south, Jericho, the Jordan Valley, the River Jordan there, and the Dead Sea. Um, this is how the West Bank looked like in 1967 on the eve of the Six-Day War. 
Just one thing to point out is the green line, which you see to the west there, that is the internationally recognized border between the West Bank and Israel. It didn't start off as a border, it was actually an armistice line from 1948 or 1949, but it has become the internationally recognized border between the West Bank and Israel. So in 1967, during the Six Day War, Israel captured the West Bank, including East Jerusalem, and the West Bank is still occupied. So what I want to do is show you some of the changes, some of the policies and measures which Israel has introduced since 1967. Um, the first thing I want to show you is settlements. These are the settlements which Israel has built, Jewish-only settlements, since 1967. And as you can see, there's quite a, a number of them, something like over 150 official authorised ones by Israel, in addition to about another 100 unauthorised ones. And the settler population now is over half a million settlers in the West Bank, including East Jerusalem, probably more like 600,000 now. Given that the po Palestinian population is 2.7 or 2.8 million, we've got to a, a situation where the settler population now is almost 20% of the Palestinian population in the West Bank. The most important thing to say about settlements is that they're against international law. You sometimes hear the um, phrase, the uh, illegal occupation, Strictly speaking, that's not true. Occupations in themselves are not illegal, just like wars are not illegal. I mean, wars may be illegal from a moral or a theological point of view, point of view, but from the point of view of international law, neither wars nor occupations are in themselves necessarily illegal. It depends how they're conducted. And in 1949, following the Second World War, there was a, a set of regulations drawn up, the Geneva Conventions, which were designed to to, to regulate the contact, conduct of both wars and occupations and to avoid the excesses we saw in the Second World War, both in terms of the actual hostilities and what happened during the Nazi occupation of Europe. And one of the most important things of the Geneva Conventions is Article 49, which is very short. And what it says is, an occupying power cannot transfer its civil population onto occupied territory. Now, under international law, Israel is considered the occupying power. The West Bank, including East Jerusalem, is occupied territory. And creating and expanding settlements is considered a violation of Article 49 of the, of the Geneva Conventions. And that is the position of the international community, all of the international community, including, of course, the government of Ireland. And the custodians are who interprets international law, the Geneva Conventions. That's the government of Switzerland. And a couple of weeks ago, they convened the contracting parties of the Geneva Conventions, and they reiterated specifically, again, that settlements are illegal and a violation of the Geneva Conventions. This, the only government who goes against this international consensus is, of course, the government of Israel, which is the major actor in this particular part. Now, if you look at the map, um, you'll see we actually we have three layers for settlements, and there's a reason for this because what you see on the map is the current built-up area of the settlements, the land which the settlements actually take up, which is about 2 or 3% of the West Bank. And you will hear Israeli government officials saying, what's the problem with settlements? What's the big focus? It's only 2 or 3% of the West Bank, and it doesn't ultimately compromise the territorial integrity of the West Bank. But if we look at the full extent of the full print, footprint of settlements, it's rather different. Um, the settlements in the West Bank, they're, just, they're organized into um, municipal and regional councils, and I've put the land which the municipal councils control. And you can see it's wider than the current built-up area of the settlements, so we've gone to from about 2 to 3% of the West Bank, which the built-up settlements <coughs> cover, to about 7% of the West Bank. But in addition to the municipal council, we've got two large regional councils in the West Bank. We've got the Jordan Valley one in the north and the Dead Sea one. So I'll show you now the land which they control.
And you, as you can see, that's much more extensive than the actual built-up area of the settlements. In fact, the land which the combined between the, the built-up area of the settlements, the municipal council and the regional council, is over 40% of the West Bank, actually 42.7% of the West Bank, including, as you can see, almost all the eastern area the Jordan Valley, which is very fertile, and the Dead Sea area. So if we want to look at the full extent of the settlement control of land in the West Bank, it's almost half of the land in the West Bank. And what that means is that land is not available to Palestinians, neither to private Palestinians or to the Palestinian Authority in Ramallah. This land has been confiscated, contrary to international law, using various legal or legalistic methods and it's been handed over to the settlements and presumably it'll be used for the future expansion of the settlements and it's not available to Palestinians. So clearly that's the most important physical division in the West Bank. But we have others. The next one I want to show you is the wall or the barrier. Which yes. Um, and you can see, it's just come up, it stretches from the top of the Jordan Valley down to the central, to the southern Hebron area. If it's um, built or finished according to plan, it will be over 700 kilometers long. That is the plan. At the moment, about 60% has been built. Um, and it, it covers <clears throat> the most important thing about the wall or the barrier is not so much the, um, the structure itself, but the route. Um, I'm not so sure how clear it is there, but you can see that it goes quite um, dramatically from the Green Line, which is the internationally recognised um, border in the West Bank. The whole question of the wall was referred to the International Court of Justice in 2004. The International Court of Justice is the world's highest judicial body. The question was referred to it, and what the International Court of Justice said is that Israel has a right to build a wall. In fact, Israel has a duty to build a wall. Of course, the official reason given for the wall was to prevent suicide bombers from the West Bank going into Israel and blowing themselves up and killing Israeli civilians. Now, nobody denies that or disputes that Israel has a serious security um, problem. And the whole issue, of course, of suicide bombers is contrary to international law. And the International Court of Justice agreed with that. Israel can build a wall, but it must be in conformity with international law. The Green Line is the internationally recognised border, so basically if the wall is built on the Green Line, it's legal, but where it goes away from the Green Line into the West Bank, including East Jerusalem, it's illegal. And at least 85% of the route of the wall goes into the West Bank, and therefore the majority of the route of the, West, of the wall is illegal, according to the International Court of Justice. You can see how if it's built according to plan, it will take about 10% of the West Bank, which will be de facto cut off from the West Bank and annexed to Israel. That's something in our organisation that we monitor. We monitor the impact of the wall on Palestinians. And the major impact is on farmers, because the wall goes to about 150 Palestinian communities or villages, and it cuts off land which they own. And what's happened since 2002 when this started is progressively farmers who need to go to their land, it's mainly olive trees, that's the main crop in the West Bank, they need to apply for permits to actually um, access their land. This is their own land. These permits are difficult to obtain. We do monitor, we know that at, at under 50% of farmers actually get permits to go to their land. They're turned down for security and other reasons. Even if you get a permit, you can only access your land through specific gates. We also monitor this. There are 80 gates installed by the Israeli army along the full extent of the wall, from the top of the Jordan Valley right down to the Hebron area. That may seem a lot, but if you remember, the wall itself is 700 kilometers long. That's basically one gate every nine kilometers. And that's for 150 different Palestinian communities. When we actually look at how the gates operate, only nine of these gates open on a daily basis, which is, if you think of it, is about one gate operating daily for every 80 kilometers. So very clearly, the, the gate and permit regime is not 
It has not been designed for the benefit of the Palestinian farmers. And what we've seen from our monitoring is that it had a big impact on agricultural livelihoods with farmers abandoning their land because they can't get them to them on a regular basis or else turning away from, for example, from greenhouses and growing wheat instead, which you don't need to access on a daily basis but brings in a much lower economic <coughs> value. And the final physical um, division I want to show you is the various checkpoints, roadblocks in the West Bank. And you can see, this is also something we monitor. Currently, there are about 400, over 400 different roadblocks, checkpoints, various um, ditches, trenches, etc., all internal in the West Bank, essentially put in for security. And these, of course, um, make access and movement in the West Bank very difficult. So if you look at the map, it's this combination, first of all, of settlements and the wall or the barrier, and then the various road, roadblocks. You see how fragmented the West Bank is. And what does that mean? Well, it causes problems for Palestinians for accessing basic services, going to school, going to hospital, getting to clinics, accessing workplaces. And it also makes it very difficult if you're a service deliverer, if you're a UN agency or a NGO, how do you actually deliver services, health and educational services in such a fragmented environment now, what I want to do now is remove all these, which we can easily do with PowerPoint, and go back to the map as it looked in 1967, before settlements and before the wall and before the various checkpoint. So now we're back to the wall still there, and that's a little bit difficult to remove. So now we're back to the 1967 map before the Israeli occupation. What I want to show you now is another, a different um, set of restrictions or divisions, which are not necessarily physical. Clearly you can see a settlement or you can see a roadblock or you can see the wall. These are bureaucratic or administrative divisions. But even though you can't see them, we would argue in the UN that these are as restrictive or as divisive as the physical ones. And the major one comes from the Oslo Accords. The Oslo Accords were divide, devised in 1994, 1995, with the idea, or at least the hope, of delivering a Palestinian state within five years. Clearly that hasn't happened, but this is still the operation, operating regime in the West Bank. So the West Bank has been divided into three areas, administrative areas, areas A, B, and C. Here's area A and B. Barrier doesn't want to move, it seems. Um, here's A and B, and this is area C. Now, we've put A and B together on the map. That, those are the brown areas on the map. There is some difference, but for our purposes, it's not really important. And the blue or the mauve on the map is area C. Now, even on this small-scale map, you can see that, first of all, that areas A and B are the, min the minority part of the West Bank. It's about 40% of the West Bank, which area C, the blue, then is 60% of the West Bank. And the other important feature is, as you can see, areas A and B are not contiguous. They're broken up into different blocks or cantons, whereas area C is contiguous. You can go from any part of area C to another part without going through A or B, but if you want to go from one A or B block to another, you have to pass through area C. Now, what are these areas A, B, and C? Well, starting in 1994, the Palestinian Authority was set up and they were given jurisdiction in the brown areas. And although this was supposed to conclude in, in 1999, it didn't, and we're still in 2015, 16 years later, we're still stuck, if you like, with this map. So the Palestinian Authority in Ramallah only has jurisdiction in the brown parts of the map, which is less than 40%. And the blue part of the map, which is 60%, Israel has retained full security control. But what they've also done is they've retained control over planning, zoning, and building. So what that means is if a Palestinian wants to build in the blue part of the map, which is 60%, 
He or she must obtain a permit, a building permit from the Israeli authorities, not just for residential building, but even for an animal shelter or a basic water infrastructure, any type of building that, as we say, entails a hammer and nail. You have to apply for a permit from the Israeli authorities, which you probably will not be surprised to hear, are very difficult to obtain. We do have some statistics and something only 1% of Area C is zoned so that Palestinians can get permits easily. And what happens if they build without permits? In that case, which happens of course because they don't have any alternative, the Israeli authorities come and they demolish their structures including animal structures. And this is something we monitor. Last year we had over a thousand people displaced in Area C by the Israeli authorities because they demolished their shelters, some multiple times. It also affects international work. Any international project, if Irish Aid, for example, wants to implement a project in Area C, 60% of the West Bank, which entails any building, then they must also apply for a permit from the Israeli authority or the implementing agency. For example, if Oxfam is going to do it, they must also obtain a permit. Of last year, of the something like 30 or 40 percent of the demolitions were actually internationally funded um, demolitions. So what we have in practice in 2015 and for the last 20 years basically is that in most of the West Bank, Palestinians find it extremely difficult, if not impossible, to build. But there are two other, and this is an administrative subdivision. You don't, there's no sign saying you're leaving area A or B and en entering C, but it, it is a very strictly enforced um, restriction on Palestinian development in the West Bank. And there are two other subdivisions of um, area C. Something like almost 20% of the West Bank has been declared military areas, which I'll show you. Those are the, the dark blue on the map. What's a military area? Well, it's an area which is controlled by the Israeli army, and these are areas where Palestinians are not allowed to enter, and certainly not allowed to live. Now, we, there are Palestinians living in these blue areas, but they're living there illegally, so they can be evicted at any time. The, sort of, the blue on the, south, the very southern um, blue area on the map there, we have something like over 1,200 or 1,300 Bedouins living there who can, they lost a court case in the Israeli High Court, which agreed with the Israeli army that they're, they're living there illegally and they can be evicted at any stage. So within the blue, air, the area C on the map, we have this other major subdivision where not only can Palestinians not live, not um, build, but they also legally, under Israeli law, ca cannot live. And there's one further subdivision which I want to show you, which is nature reserves. Now, 10% of the West Bank has been declared nature reserves by the Israeli Authority. Now, normally that might be considered a progressive environmental um, measure. Um, what it means is that the animal and plant life is, is protected, officially protected in these areas, and again it mainly affects the Bedouin community. They cannot cultivate these areas or they cannot, for example, have their, as you can see from the photograph, the sheep and goats are not allowed to graze in these areas. And if they do wander into these areas, which are not always marked, the animals can be confiscated or the, the Bedouin or the herders can be fined. So if we look at the map, and again these are bureaucratic divisions. We have 60% of the West Bank where Palestinians cannot build, but within these areas we have a large part where they cannot le legally live. And then of course we have another 10% where they cannot cultivate or graze. And of course this puts pressure on communities there to displace them. If you cannot actually practice your livelihoods then of course you cannot stay. So these are the administrative divisions on the West Bank. And what if we go back and add the first ones, we saw the physical ones, which are again the settlements. And then the, the barrier. And then the closures. This is what the West Bank looks like by this combination of both physical and administrative divisions in terms of Palestinian access and movement. Not just access to services but also access to resources. And we have one layer to show this, which is the shrinking space.
And so it's basically the dark area on the map to all intents and purposes is off limits to Palestinians in terms of access and movement. If we look at the photograph, I think the photograph is very illustrative. Um, on the photograph, you can see there's a settlement on top there. That's Mala Demim settlement, which is just to the east of Jerusalem. That is actually illegal under international law, a violation of Article 49 of the Geneva Conventions. You can see, however, it's thriving in terms of the building going on in it. And underneath it, we have a Bedouin encamp encampment. Now, under international law, the Bedouins as the indigenous population are actually supposed to be protected. But in reality, all of their buildings, their shacks there, have demolition orders because they have, under Israeli law in the West Bank, they have been built illegally without permits. They couldn't obtain the permits. So any of these um, Bedouin dwellings can be uh, demolished at any stage. I leave it there, Fiek. So I'm going to ask Ray a question, and then we're, going to, uh, we're running out of time. Um, Ray has kindly uh, left a lot of uh, copies of the maps uh, that you've seen here out, outside. At the, it is downstairs. Is it? In the foyer. In the yeah. foyer, so, so please, please, please take that. So um, I've got one very simple question for you. Uh, all this information is, what is, what do you do? What's your job? Um, well, my job, or our office job is to actually monitor this, so we do. Um, the, the mapping, for example, is done by, we've got a very big mapping department, um, and as you, you can probably appreciate, um, understanding the geography is very, very important. When I first went to the West Bank, which is o over 30 years ago now, I thought that the history was the most important issue, which it is to a certain extent, but then I realized that actually geography is, is actually more important, if anything, because you, for example, if you hear there's a demolition um, and the Israeli authorities will say, well, of course we demolished because um, the people didn't have uh, building permits. And that's the same in any place in the world. You cannot build in Dublin, for example, without a building permit. But you have to understand the, what leads to this. If you like, the actual demolition is the tip of the iceberg. And this is the sort of the eight 80% or 90% of the iceberg which is under the water which actually leads to the humanitarian situation. So we actually monitor this. We, we, we do weekly reports, we do monthly reports. During the Gaza war, for example, we do daily reports. So it is the official UN record. Basically, we are doing the official UN record. Although, as a friend of mine said, it feels like we're doing one long um, obituary sometimes because we don't see much change, I have to say, uh, actually on the ground. But I think it is important to actually document wh what's happening. Okay. So I'm going to take three questions, and they have to be questions we can discuss and debate and statement uh, during the break. And what I'd like to do is take the three questions in a row so that actually Ray can, can answer all together, and then we'll go to a coffee break. So hands up, there are two roving mics. That's one question here. And there's one behind you there, yeah. So just a question, and then we, we'll, we'll go, we'll, go, uh, we'll do a, a simultaneous uh, answers, yeah. Um, thank you for the, for the presentation. I was just wondering if you've ever um, had the opportunity to present this map in the way you've presented it to us uh, with Israeli officials present. And I'm curious to see how they react to the kind of geography as you've laid it out for us. Thank you, Sim. Question over here, and then one final question. Uh, that was always my question. I would like to add whether or not the presentation or a presentation of this kind has been shown uh, at the highest level uh, in government circles in the United States and tied to both questions. Uh, what is your analysis or sense of the motivation of the Israeli government in persisting with this? I know it's a simple question. It's a, it's a complex question, but why are they doing it this way? Okay, thank you. And one final question. It's a gentleman in the middle up there, Helena. Yeah. Could you also say something about the water supply? Okay, sure. thank you. Um, the question about have we, we have presented it to um, the Israeli government, I have colleagues actually, Israeli colleagues in our office who, who actually do the presentation in Hebrew. 
I can't say we've done it to the highest levels because um, in Israel there's quite a, there's a lot of denial about the issues on the ground. But I can say that when you show it to Israeli audiences, they're also surprised. They've heard about settlements, for example, but they don't, they're, even they don't know the full extent of, of the settlement footprint. So we have, um, we have presented, or my colleagues have presented to Israeli audience, but I can't say we've done it to the highest level. Um, I have to say we don't have the best relations with the Israeli authorities also, which makes it a little bit difficult. Um, the question about US, we, we have done it in the US. I just, before I came this morning, I, I counted how many countries I've done. I, I've actually done this presentation in 18 countries, including the first time in Ireland, I'm here the second time today. Um, and we have done, uh, we've done it in the UN, in New York, I've done it as the, the, the noon briefing in, in New York. We've done it in Brussels quite a number of times to, to EU policymakers and the UN in Geneva. Um, and we have done it too in the US. And we also, in our office in East Jerusalem, we get a lot of visiting delegations. Um, and so we get a lot of uh, groups coming through, including diplomatic groups. And, and it's been, we've done this hundreds of times. Um, again, the point is the information yeah. is, is easily available. The information is available. Actually, this is available on, on our website if anyone wants to download it. But um, again, in terms of changes. Uh, I'm not sure how much change there's been. And then the question um, about the design behind this. I mean, clearly this is no accident. We're looking at policies which started in a, at least before 1967 and have continued. Now, I think it's important that there's no necessarily one monolithic Israeli um, pers perspective on the West Bank. Officially, the Israeli government has signed up to the two-state solution. And perhaps what I should have said is, you know, apart from the humanitarian impact, what is the political impact of that? Because the point of a two-state solution, which everybody has signed up to, um, is to have a Palestinian state in the West Bank with a capital in East Jerusalem. Now, it was President Bush who said that it shouldn't look like Swiss cheese. Well, I'll leave it up to you. To We had a Swiss delegation, and they said, yes, there's fewer holes in Swiss cheese than in this <laughs> delegation. Um, and then, of course, the connection with, with, with Gaza. So clearly there are mm. elements in the Israeli government who, although officially they signed up to a two-state solution, are not really interested. And, of course, this continues. And this makes a two-state solution very difficult to implement because of all these, these policies, okay. these facts on the ground. Okay, so and one final comment from me, uh, Ray. Um, just explain to us the, the conundrum around the access to the Dead Sea versus, versus aid. Yes, um, the, la, not 2013, the World Bank um, actually did a, a long report in Area C on the economic impact. And what they said is if the Palestinian Authority had access particularly to the Dead Sea and to the Jordan Valley, which of course are their own resources, um, the Dead Sea is a unique um, f phenomenon, uh, as anyone who's been there know knows. It, it obviously attracts a lot of tourism, but also there's a lot of mineral extraction, potash and bromine. And the, as you can see from the map, actually most of the Dead Sea is in the West Bank on th this side. It's not actually in Israel, but of course it's exploited by Israel. So what the World Bank said that if the Palestinian Authority had access to it for tourism and mineral extraction, and to Area C in general, it would be worth over almost $3.4 billion annually. That's the optimum um, economic value, which of course is actually more money than Palestine receives in international aid. So it, basically, if the Palestinian Authority had access to their own resources, they wouldn't need any international aid. And in fact, they would be, in a, in a sense, a, a net exporter of, of okay. money, if you like. Well, thank you, and, and give a round of applause to Ray. Thank you. 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 Th